Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Offer here with you, and we have a special program for you tonight, so we're not going to take too much time. have uh, on the program with me Mr. Larry Serber, who you may have seen on television, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago. It wasn't last week, uh, two weeks ago, who uh, was on 30 minutes before our, uh, our program, and we're going to be discussing some things, uh, I guess, concerning uh, science versus religion, I guess would be maybe the simple uh thesis of the of the discussion tonight so we hope that you uh have your note paper note notepads and pencils ready and we're going to uh, uh delve into that uh in just a few minutes we're going to give you our content information in case you'd like to visit with us or email us or reach us any way where we can be of assistance to you we're so, so glad to do that if you'd like to copy this program tonight you can email me at a word from the lord at gmail.com or you can give us a call uh call into the station tonight we will have some question and answer uh session <clears throat> And so you'll be able to call and ask a question, and I hope that you'll do that. Uh, please have your question ready and uh, ask the question, and, and we may say we'll let each caller get to have two questions because sometimes you want a follow-up question, but uh, try to limit to that so we can get as many calls in as, as we can. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we're going to have a, a two-hour program tonight, and uh, the format's going to be, our I guess, our basic format. We're going to have... Uh, Ten-minute speeches each for the first hour. Each of us have three ten-minute speeches. I'm going to let uh, uh, Mr. Larry Serber go first. And then we're going to have 20 minutes of uh, question and answers. And then we're going to have 20 minutes of phone calls. So uh, your program, your calls will come in at the last of the of the second hour. So we're not going to waste any more time or take any more time uh, away. We're going to begin our, our discussion <clears throat> with Mr. Larry Serber. He's the former teacher in this area. I think uh, writer in the in the uh, Eden newspaper, uh, and so uh, many of you probably know who he is, or at least know of him. So anyway, we're going to let him have the first ten minutes. So Larry, uh, you may begin. Uh, thank you, James. Um, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to come on your program. Uh, when I was here before, I requested that people tape the show because. I like to be held accountable for what I have said, not what people may remember what they think I've said. I'm here to talk about, as James mentioned, science versus religion. I consider myself a scientist. I um, oppose all superstition, and I consider religion just another form of superstition. I know many people think that science and religion can lie down together and get along just fine. I absolutely do not believe that. I believe that science and religion are in great conflict. And above all, I believe that religion has held back the progress of science, especially medical science, in so many ways. In fact, I think beside the cradle of every new science, every new innovation in medicine, there lie the corpses of extinguished theologies. There's, it seems as, as medicine and science progress, more and more of the old views are just pass away. Science cannot thrive and grow if it's inhibited. It has to be completely uninhibited. There can be no faith, there can be no allegiance to old books like Bibles or old creeds. Science must be free to answer questions and to ask questions, any and all questions, always. We never in science accept theories on faith. If a scientist comes up and says that his theory is the end all of, of all theories, and whether he's an evolutionary biologist or whatever, we're going to kick the legs out from under him because we're going to keep challenging his theory. We're going to keep asking new questions. If he thinks the case is closed, it's not. It never is. As we look at the universe and try to figure out how things operate, we don't stop. We might have been wrong. That's a big difference between the Bible, which is set in stone, and modern science, which keeps asking questions. Science operates very different from religion. With science, we observe the world using our five senses and amplifying our senses with our instruments, our microscopes and our um, telescopes, our uh, magnetic resonance imaging devices. We look, 
We try to figure out how things work. Why, why does this planet move this way? Or why does this heat leave this warm object and heat this cooler object? We try to come up with the best answers that we can. Then we do experiments. We use mathematics. We try to arrive at a good guess as to what's really happening, what's causing it to happen. We may be wrong. New data may come in later, and we'll have to change and say that what we thought was happening was not correct. Religion, to me, is anthropomorphic. And that's a big word, but it's easily explained. When something is anthropomorphic, that means that we use human ways to describe other things in the universe. Uh, Norm Fields, on his show three weeks ago, I think it was, was using the old Paley argument from design that was first set out by William Paley in 1802. He said, if I'm walking through a field and I see a fine pocket watch, I know that those gears and those springs and things didn't just lie around and then get blown together by a hurricane. That watch was designed by a conscious designer for a purpose, the purpose of keeping accurate time. And I think Norm went on to show a camera and a tape recorder or something. He said, these things didn't just happen. They weren't just blown together by random chance. They had to be designed. And I agree. But when we use Paley's argument and we apply it to the world of nature and the universe, that's where the argument falls apart. Norm said, a human eye is much more complicated than a camera. True. So it could not have just happened. It had to be created and planned and for a purpose. But that's not the way nature works. When I was on here a couple weeks ago, I said nature doesn't care about us. The universe just grinds on like old man river. It's not good or bad. It doesn't care about human beings. Accidents happen. Things just move on. So the anthropomorphic view, we explain nature acting like a man. Not, not just a man, but a super ultra man, a god big enough to stride across the Milky Way galaxy. We say that things can only happen that way. But the reason William Paley's argument and the reason Norm Fields' argument fall to the ground is because if you say nothing grandiose and complex and wonderful and amazing can just happen by random, you're always left with that old question, isn't God the most complex thing we know, the most grand thing? Then we have to ask, who made God? So we haven't really gotten anywhere. You're going to be forced to answer God was always there. And I just skip that step and I say the universe was always there. The universe was not created. It's infinitely old and it's going on. It'll, it will be here forever. That's my view. Uh, everything is part of nature. There's nothing outside of nature. There's no supernatural. There's no ghosts. There are no gods, no devils, no witches, no demons. As far as I'm concerned, I've never seen... Um, a bit of evidence for that. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that we have to explain it with some anthropomorphic view of something like a man. If you don't understand how an internal combustion engine in a car works, that does not mean that you have to say that, well, that car goes down the street because an invisible God is blowing it down the street with his breath. Years ago, people thought the sun went across the sky. It doesn't. It appears to. It looks like it comes up over in the east and is more or less overhead at noon and then goes down in the west. That doesn't happen. We now know, using science and math, that the earth turns, the sun doesn't go across the sky. But back when people thought it did go across the sky, their explanation was it went across the sky because a god, a special god, the sun god, carried it across the sky every day in his chariot. To me, that's childish. And again, it's anthropomorphic. It's nature acting like, like a man. Uh, I'm very interested in brain research. I do an enormous amount of reading about the physiology of the brain. It's fascinating to me. We've learned so much just in the last 10 or 15 years. In fact, even in the last two or three years, amazing cutting-edge research about the brain. And my view is that my brain is like a VCR tape. If you have a VCR, you have a tape, that's sort of like your brain. When you're born, your five senses begin to take in information. You think about this information, you worry about it, you remember it, you reflect on it, you dream about it, you have hopes and fears, and all that ends up later on being the you that is you. 
And your mind is not like a VCR tape. Your mind is like the, your favorite TV shows taped on that tape. It's a complex electromagnetic pattern. Your VCR lays the shows on in a pattern, and then it comes back when you have the play function. It reads those patterns and converts them into beams that hit the fluorescent dots on your screen and light them up very quickly. Now, what happens when you destroy that tape? What if you throw it into a furnace and just melt it into a runny pile of plastic mylar? Your shows are gone. Your tape's gone. And what I believe is that when I die and my brain rots into a stinking mass and has maggots in it, there is no way that that me with all those memories that I took in, all that information I took in and thought about is going to continue to exist. I will be gone. I will feel just like I did before I was ever born. In other words, I won't feel at all. I'll cease to exist. I'll be completely broken down. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm going to, as a scientist, I'm going to be using some large, fairly large numbers, like millions, billions, trillions. And I know most of us have a hard time grasping big numbers like that. And I've got a little trick that can help people to see this more clearly. If you have a clock and it has a second hand on it, look up at it and think how long it would take for a million seconds to tick off. It takes a little less than 12 days. Now, that's not too bad. You could count to a million. It, in 12 days, if you didn't eat or sleep, counting one per second, you could count to a million. But what about a billion? That takes 33 years. And what about a trillion? That takes 33,000 years for a trillion seconds to tick off your clock. So the next time the government tells you they've spent a trillion dollars of your tax money on bombs and military bases to control this planet, Think about the trillion. I think my time is. Yeah. Okay. My time is up. <clears throat> okay. I uh, I want to answer some of the things that uh, that Mr. Server said. I'm going to take my time and answer them actually in, a, in my, my next speech, if that's all right. But I do want to point out some things that, that he did say <clears throat> before I begin. You know, one of the things that he, he pointed out was that religion has to have things set in stone, or that it is set in stone, whereas science is, uh, is uh, never uh, set in stone. It's, it's always searching or looking. I'm, I'm, I'm using my own words there. He said science was being hit, uh, uh, uninhibited. Free to ask questions. Well, we, we certainly appreciate the freedom to ask questions. We encourage that. And the reason we do is because we're looking for the absolute, the thing that is set in stone. And the reason why I want to impress upon your minds the need to have something set in stone is because if there is nothing set in stone, if there is nothing uh, concrete, then everything is subjective. Now, I know when, uh, uh, when Larry called on our program back on uh, July the 31st, uh, before we'd ever met, this was one of the topics that we were discussing was the subjectivity of, of morals. And this is why I think it's so important, friends, is because no matter what is discussed tonight, no matter what is uh, set forth scientifically or, 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 or religiously or whatever, if there is no... Uh, objective rule that is a set in stone something that does not change then it pretty much belongs to everybody anybody's guess now Benjamin Franklin said only a virtuous people are capable of freedom as nations become corrupt and vicious they have a need of masters and I agree with that because when individuals <clears throat> start determining that that evil is, is, is becoming more and more prevalent usually what they have what they say is we need more laws. No, we don't need more masters, more laws. What we need is we need more virtue. And so if the law, the rule of law, is the concrete foundation of a society, then I submit that morals and ethics are the reinforcement steel. If you don't have morals and ethics in your, in your society, then what you're going to have is you're going to have immorality. And no matter what laws you have, you certainly will not have a wholesome or a virtuous society. Now, 
when we start defining terms, we have to realize that there has to be a standard from which we get these terms. In other words, if someone says good, this is good, it has to, there has to be an objective standard from which we all realize good uh, uh, emanates from. In other words, everything good comes down from a certain standard of good that does not change. And so when we talk about ethics, we're talking about morals. We're talking about a code of right and wrong. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, Mr. Serber is a, is a professed atheist and humanist, and I submit that humanism and atheism, they go hand in hand, but I submit that what we have is we have a, an idea that actually promotes subjective ethics. Now, I don't know how, how uh, Larry feels about the Humanist Manifesto. I suppose as a humanist that he would adhere to at least some of the tenets of it. But this is, uh, he's, he's nodding in agreement. So uh, <clears throat> this is a statement from the Humanist Manifesto. And notice what it says about uh, more or ethics and where, how ethics are derived. It says ethics is autonomous. That means everybody gets to do their own thing. And it's situational. That is, depending on the situation you are, that determines uh, what you do. Ethics are right and wrong. They're autonomous and situations. They need no theological or ideological sanction. In other words, you don't have to go to the Bible. You don't have to get something from your God that says this is right or wrong. It's just what you determine to do. Now notice, ethics stems from human need and interest. Now, basically what you have there, friends, is you do whatever you want to do depending on your need or on your interest. Now, if someone determines that they need something that you have, then their ethics might dictate that they can take it. And I'm submitting to you, friends, that if we don't have a standard, an objective rule for right and wrong, then we'll have a very, very crazy society whose rules will be topsy-turvy, good will be bad, bad will be good, because no one will be able to say that is good or that is bad, because everybody's standard will be their own. You see? Now, just to give me a case in point of how, how, how twisted and uh, I guess you could say upset the apple cart this can be. I want you to, to uh, notice these articles that, are, that appeared in the paper. This is uh, uh, from Mr. Serber himself. He's talking about fishing. Now, I know some of you like fishing, but notice what he says about, about catching a fish. He says the pull of a fish. What is it? He says it's an animal fighting for its life. Doesn't that animal want to live as badly as I do? Now, I don't disagree that that animal probably doesn't want to live as badly as, as I do. Maybe it has, a, it has a desire to live. But notice what he says. But hurting living things is not wholesome and should not be fun. Many people were long comfortable with the idea of Indians and slaves and Chinamen being subhuman and unable to suffer. Now, friends, to compare the suffering of humans, right or wrong, to the sufferings or the fight for life of a fish is a far stretch, but it comes because the sense of right and wrong and the sense of the place of the human being in the, in the role of the scheme of things is all twisted. You see, humanists would say that evolution, basically the fish would actually be our, our distant relative somewhere down the line. So we're not any different than animals. And I'm saying that creates a problem later on for ethics, for what's right and wrong. Now, can you imagine comparing Indians and slaves and Chinamen and how people used to feel about them or how maybe they still feel about them to the tug of a fish on the line and hurting living things is not wholesome and should not be fun? Well, if, you're gonna, if we're going to say that hurting living things is not wholesome, then I would wonder if Mr. Serber would say, well, don't fish and don't even kill that fly that's buzzing around. That's a living thing. Don't spray Lysol because you might kill some microbes, you see? You see how, how the domino effect goes? Now notice this. Here's another, here's another uh, letter that he wrote about putting the pictures of animals in the paper. And he, and he compares the putting of deer, hunters with their deer in the paper, he compares it to segregation laws. Now, friends, I would agree with his statement about segregation laws and Jim Crow's laws about segregation. Those are wrong. It's wrong. The Bible says that, that we're all made of one blood. You know, we're all human beings created by God. But to compare that to the treatment of animals or to say that 
uh, we're taking pleasure in the killing of animals just like we took pleasure in the harming of, of human beings is a far stretch. Now granted, people didn't. People didn't view human beings any more than animals at one point in time. But I'm not going to say that they're on the same level. I'm not going to say stop hunting just because we should stop uh, segregating. I believe we ought to live together in peace and harmony. But by all means, you shouldn't have to give up your hunting. But you see, but this is what it gets down to. When it gets right down to it, here is the crux of morals. It's morals that people do what they want to do because they don't want to be repressed. Notice this. This again is from the Humanist Manifesto. We believe that intolerant attitudes, often cultivated by orthodox religions, that's what he said about religion suppressing science. Well, they'd also say that religion suppress, uh, uh, unduly repress sexual conduct. The right to birth control, abortion, and divorce should be recognized. You see, when you start saying ethics are derived from uh, personal interests or needs, then anything goes. Anything goes. And what you start doing is you start saying, well, you know what? We need to consider all living things and don't harm them. But then we turn right around and say, but we want the freedom. We want the freedom to abort our children. Or we want the freedom to harm innocent children. So I'm saying there's the, there's the, there's the struggle here. Why would Mr. Serber protest to hunting, fishing, killing chickens, uh, but not the killing of children. Now, I know that, that he has uh, uh, made this statement. I'm going to go ahead to this one. Uh, let me just move on here. Remember that uh, ethics are uh, derived from personal or human need and interest. And when you think that, friends, when you have that attitude or when you start from that premise, then it doesn't matter what people uh, say are good, it's always going to come down to what they want to do. Mr. Serber can say things are right, things are wrong, things are good, things are bad, and so can anybody else out there. But if we don't have a standard of authority, right and wrong, and I submit it's the Bible, not, it's not religion that's holding people back, but what's holding people back is their desire to do what they want to do. Okay, first of all, I would like to say that... Uh, Paul Kurtz, who wrote the Humanist Manifesto along with some other members of the PSYCOP, the Committee for the um, Scientific Investigation of Paranormal Claims, and I'm very familiar with this, and I, I take two magazines written by Paul Kurtz, Free Inquiry and um, The Skeptical Inquirer. I would say that Paul Kurtz would be appalled at some of the things James said about him because he doesn't want us to say anything goes, anything's right. He's a very humane and struggles with morality, very humane man. Secondly, I'd like to say that article that I wrote, or the letter I wrote to the Greensboro paper, saying that I felt it was terrible, a terrible example for our children that a kid's grinning, holding up a bloody deer that he splattered the leaves with, teaches an insensitivity to all life. And my point in saying that was, I know I've been writing letters to the Greensboro News and Record for years, complaining about their promotion of deer hunting. I think it's a cruel and crazy and barbaric thing that belongs to go the, you know, should go the way of cannibalism and human sacrifice. But I said, I'm not deterred. I'm not, you know, worried. I'm not discouraged. Because I know many years ago, back in the 60s, I wrote letters to the Greensboro Daily News. And I said, you know, all kinds of things about segregation was wrong. And the editors of the Greensboro paper wrote back, Something to this effect. We wish these outside agitating Yankees would leave us alone down here. Our colored people are perfectly content until these communists and Yankees come down and get them stirred up. So that's changed, and I think the attitude eventually will change. It's changing all over this country and, and in other parts of the world that people do not think it's good to present to children that it's glorious and wholesome and wonderful to go out and show your manhood and say, look at that deer. He wanted to live, but I killed him. And I killed him to put his antlers up on the wall and win points on a point system. Sick, barbaric, disgusting. Okay, James spoke, after I spoke last time, a good bit about objective morals. He says that's in the Bible, and without... Without objective morals in the Bible or objective morals from the law, like you've got a cop threatening you with prison or a judge 
threatening you with prison or without a big God up in the sky with his giving his commandments to Moses carved in stone, that you're going to run amok. I don't know where he's coming from, but that's not really true. People who have been serious, contemplative, philosophical students of morality, people who have really tried to see if there was anything to God, and people who have studied science have honestly tried to tell the truth the best they could. People like Luther Burbank, the great botanist, who discovered so much that's helped farmers. He was one of our greatest scientists. He was a hard-working man. He was a moral, decent man. He was a compassionate, generous, kind man. Everyone who knew him loved him. He would work 20 hours a day a lot of the time on his projects with plants and hybrids and things. And yet he hated the Bible and religion. He said, I will have nothing to do with such a God as the God of the Old Testament with all his bloody slaughters, his telling the chosen people to slaughter all the other unchosen people, and then saying it was justice. He said, it makes me sick. He was a fine man. He was a law-abiding man. He didn't run amok and murder and kidnap and rape and molest children and sell drugs. Not at all. So it's insane for these people to say that when you get away from the Bible with honest study and you're criticizing religion and say it's just another fable like Santa Claus, that you're going to be, you won't have that rock. You won't have that objective morality. In fact, I think subjective morality is superior because it comes from your conscience. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You don't have the threat hanging over your head like the sword of Damocles about to fall on you with a judge sending you to prison or a or God sending you to eternal hell, you behave to other people like you would want to behave. And I know James will say, but not everybody's like you. Maybe people didn't have a kind father like you did, Larry. It's the law of the jungle. Everybody's going to be a law unto himself, and then we'll just have chaos and madness. It is not the secular humanists, the scientists who've criticized religion that are out here raping and robbing and murdering. I taught students who were troubled, who had been in, in violent crimes, some of them. Some of them had a mother in prison, a father in prison, maybe both. And if I said, I tried not to teach religion in class. I tried to steer clear of these things, but they could tell. You know, I feel so strongly about these things. One time I was talking about ghosts, and I said, it's stupid to believe in ghosts because we've talked about transfer of energy. Matter transfers to other matter, energy. If my car runs into yours, it knocks your car because they both have mass and they take up space. And but how is a ghost with its immaterial non-matter finger going to push down that organ key upstairs in the um, Bear Hill Mansion and play the organ? It would go right through the organ. And how does a ghost, for that matter, move air molecules with its immaterial non-matter vocal cords and moan and have, it, have the air molecules hit my ear? It's just stupid. And a little girl named Crystal, I'll never forget this, raised her hand. I said, Mr. Serber, you don't believe in ghosts? And I said, no, that's what I'm telling you. It's been discredited long ago by sane, reasonable people. It's goofy. And she said, what about the Holy Ghost? And I said, Crystal, I don't believe in any kind of ghost. Well, this little girl got mad, but she wasn't from an atheist, secular humanist, agnostic, or as James says, <laughs> agnostheist or whatever. She wasn't from anybody that had thought about and come to a philosophical conclusion about religion. She was from a family that you know, thought they were very uh, fundamental religious, and she was too, but she had beat another a girl's mother in the head with a length of two by four one time and was sent to a juvenile detention center. I know that. So it's not the people that criticize science like me that are dangerous and running amok and breaking into homes and snatching purses. That's ridiculous. I am a law-abiding person. Well, I take that back. For a while there, I was wearing an illegal motorcycle helmet. They changed the law in 2008, and I had a little thin helmet, and my wife kept harping on me to get a thick padded helmet that complied with the Department of Transportation, and I've done that. So other than that, I honestly can't think of any laws that I've been breaking in a long, long time. I used some drugs when I was in college that were illegal, but that was a long, long time ago, and um, I really don't break laws. And pl what's more, I'm much more moral now than I was back when I was a teenager, and I, I used to believe in God and the Bible. I was raised a Methodist. It's true, I just had that old sprinkling baptism. I didn't have the good kind that saves you. But my mother was very religious. My dad, they both went to church and took me to church. And I, I was tacitly religious. But I would pick on other boys at school and hurt their feelings and make fun of them. And I, I feel horrible about that. I, I'm very ashamed of that. And I'm very proud that I am ashamed of that. I wish I could go back and change that. I wish I could tell these people how sorry I was that I hurt their feelings because that was awful. So I'm more moral now that I've gotten away from the Bible, not less. I don't need that objective, carved-in-stone 
threat. James mentioned the good old days when you could leave your door unlocked. Well, yeah, but for people of color, there weren't good old days back then. If a black boy winked at a white woman or whistled at her, he could be lynched. If a black man did some work for a white man and he was promised $100 and the white man decided he was only going to pay him 10 all the black man could do, even if he was a big, strong guy, was kind of look down at the ground and shuffle and say, well, well thank you, sir. They, they, they wasn't so great back in the days when you could leave your door unlocked. I want to show you a little cartoon because I've not only heard these uh, preachers talk about moral relativism, but I'm always hearing uh, Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly and other ultra-conservative TV talking heads talk about this. And sometimes I think uh, moral relativism is misunderstood because it depends on who's getting what in relation to power. And if I can do this, if I could hold this up, I don't know if you'll be able to see this at home or not, but what we have here is a farmer who has chopped down a tree and he had an accident with his axe and the tree fell on him and killed him. Well, that's very bad for the farmer and his wife and his children. Well, I guess it is unless, it's, unless he's an abusive father and, and husband. But anyway, he's chopped down the tree and these chickens are over there saying, Lord, we thank thee for this blessing. You see the chopping block there. Well, I showed this to James at my home the other day, and he said, well, now you're being like anthropomorphic. You don't know those chickens fear the chopping block. And he's right. This is kind of a silly cartoon in a way, but let's change it. Instead of this farmer over here and these chickens, let's substitute um, a slave. The farmer is a slave owner, like in 1845 when the Southern Baptists broke away, and the chickens are slaves. Well, the farmer believes a slave's his property, and um, if um, the slave escapes, and he believes he paid good money for that slave and should be brought back to it. And if a white man helps him, that white man should be lynched. So from the, you know, the slave owner's point of view, slavery is good. From the slave's point of view, being torn away from your family, you can be killed with impunity. It's very bad. I said to James um, that something about Muslims, he said, well, we're fundamentalists and we're pretty hidebound, but we're not as bad as those Muslims. No, he's not. You don't stone people to death for adultery, but, but what stopped you? The holy men? The Bible? No. What stopped you was the, um, the secular laws that took us away from barbar barbarism. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, well... The, the subjective and objective standard, I submit to you, friends, is the problem that, that Mr. Serber is going to have because um, he says, you know, subjective morality is superior. That means the mor morals that each individual determines is superior. Now, friends, I know that you really don't want to believe that. You don't believe that because all that means is Whoever the subject that is stronger or bigger is going to impress their morality upon the other. It just that's the way it's going to be. It's the law of the jungle. He's an evolutionist. He believes the survival of the fittest in the animal kingdom, which I do too. I mean, that's why the lion kills the little wildebeest instead of the big strong wildebeest is because he can force his will upon the little one. And in a society where there is no standard of right and wrong that people adhere to as a uh, as a superior rule then you're always going to have individuals who will determine that their needs and their interests are superior. Now, just uh, he says, well, he's a law-abiding citizen, and most, uh, I don't know, I'm going to try to use his term here, but I don't think I run it down. He says that they don't, that uh, individuals who are not adhering to an objective standard don't run amok. Well, I just want to give you a case in point of where subjective uh, morals had taken its toll. Here you have uh, uh, Henrik Heimler, who was the, the chief hooking bull for uh, Hitler, carried out all the orders, killed all the Jews. When he was uh, asked why they did it, he said, we had the moral right. We had the duty to our people to destroy this people. I'm talking about the Jews. Now, they had a moral right, they said, to kill the Jews. Now, what was it? What was it that made that so wrong? You see, if you live in a society 
and it, and it goes from individuals on up to the society, to the, to the nation. But if you have a society whose people say, do what's right in your own eyes, subjective morality, then pretty soon you're going to have one person or two people or a group of people whose subjective morality says, this is what's right. And they said they were morally right in doing it. Now, who was wrong there? Was Nazi Germany wrong for killing all those Jews? In our country, when, when slavery, when men stealers, that's why we have slavery in this country to begin with, because someone went over across the seas and they stole people. He talks about people ripping away from their families. Yes, that's terrible. Why? Because the objective, the high standard that God has put says men stealing is wrong. See? But when you have individuals who are making their own right based upon their own interests and, uh, and needs, well, here comes Hitler. He has an interest. He has a need. Well, the need requires him to exterminate six million Jews. Well, who said it was wrong? You see? It has to be a higher rule of authority standard of right and wrong that says it was wrong. Now, you want to talk about a nation run amok. Uh, based upon morals when people are doing their own thing, uh, do a little search on uh, liberal Missouri. Fitting name, because here's what happened. Liberal Missouri, and I apologize for the uh, size of this. I didn't have time to, to increase it, so I'll, I'll just read it to you. But liberal Missouri was uh, so named after the Liberal League in Lamar, Missouri, to which the town's organizer belonged. It was started as an atheist, free-thinker utopia in 1880 by George Walser, an anti-religionist, agnostic lawyer. He bought 2,000 acres of land and advertised across the country for atheists to come. And here's the, here's the ad. Come and found a town without a church where, where unbelievers could bring up their children without religious training and where Christians were not allowed. His idea was to build up a town that would that should exclusively be the home of infidels, a town that should have neither God, hell, church, nor saloon. Some of the early inhabitants of Liberal even encouraged other infidels to move to their town by publishing an advertisement which boasted that Liberal, quote, is the only town of its size in the United States without a priest, preacher, church, saloon, God, Jesus, hell, or the devil. Well, what was the result of this? What was the result of this? It wasn't too long that... Uh, let's see, that began in uh, uh, 18, uh, in 80, I believe. Let's see if I'm getting my, I'm sorry, I did have it larger there. Uh, the Liberal Normal School and Business Institute was another institution organized by Wasser to promote liberal education uh, free from the bias of Christian theology. This school went well advertised and soon had a large enrollment. Uh, a tract published in 1885, the Liberal Normal School and Business Institute was, quote, located in the liberal town, taught by liberal teachers and courted by the patronage of liberal patrons. Patrons, Out of this organization developed Free Thought University, which opened in 1886. Now, here's what happened. Let's come on down here. Here was the result. In 1885, May 2nd, 1885, the St. Louis Dispatch, Post Dispatch, uh, wrote an article called An Infidel Experiment. And the reporter said, The boast of the sobriety of the town is false, but few of the infidels are total abstainers. Liquor can be obtained at three different places in this town of 300 inhabitants. More drunken infidels can be seen in a year in liberal than drunken Christians among a hundred times as many church members during the same time. Swearing is commonplace, uh, for young and old alike, girls and boys swear on the streets, playground at home. Fully half of the females will swear at a large number, swear habitually. Lack of reverence for parents and of obedience to them is the rule. There are more grass widows. Grass widows are individuals who have children out of wedlock or whose spouse has left them. And grass widowers and people living together who have former companions living than in any other town of ten times the population. A good portion of the few books that are read are of the class that decency keeps under locks and keys. In other words, most people read uh, perverse books. It says uh, there are dances corrupting the use, no lack of loose women at these dances. Uh, feticide is universal. That's the killing of, 
of the fetus. Physicians of the place say that a large portion of their practice has been trying to save females from the consequences of feticide. Uh, what, what is the bottom line? It says, many drunks in three places that wish to buy alcohol in a town of 300, disobedient and rebellious children, abundance of foul language, promiscuity, feticide, we would say abortion today, slander, and prostitution. Now, that is from a city that was based upon the idea of let's free ourselves from religion. And it only lasted about five years because it was so corrupt, no one would come in, no one wanted to live there. Now, when someone says, well, religion is holding things back, I submit to you that there is a classic example. And if a scientist wants to put it in a Petri dish and let's see what we come out with, what better what better evidence is there than liberal Missouri? And also, you may look at Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia. Go back and look at the history of that. Same thing happened. They started having self-governing, and the next thing you know, you have uh, kids shooting professors. But my point is this, friends. When you don't have an objective standard of right and wrong, and everybody says, we're going to free ourselves, and we're going to have autonomous ethics, that is, we're going to make up our own rules, you're going to have things like liberal Missouri. Now, here's the reason. The problem comes because humanists want their own standard of right and wrong. This is Mr. Serber on July 31st. I know you don't want to see them suffer and you don't want to make them suffer. But what if someone else over here does want to make them suffer? How, by, why are you calling them evil? Why are you calling them evil? Why are you calling them evil? Because they make humans suffer. They but make sir, suffer. You, can't, you can't give me a reason why Making someone suffer is wrong. Yes, I can. By what standard? By my standard. I don't want okay, to Okay, that's what I'm saying, sir. That's there. my whole point. What standard? By my standard. What standard? By my standard. All right, so we're talking about suffering. Why what what makes something wrong? And he says, My standard. Well, that's what that's what the Humanist Manifesto says. My standard. And friends, if you want to say everybody gets their own standard, then what is right for one person? is not going to be right for another. What's wrong for one person is not going to be wrong for another. Everybody gets to do their own thing. And so don't tell me that freedom from religion makes things better. The proof's in the pudding. It actually makes it worse. And that's, and that's what we're dealing with. That's why you have things like Germany, where Hitler comes along and says, this is my desire, my interest. I'm going to enforce my will to carry out my desires and my interest, even at the expense of taking someone else's life. So... Uh, thank you for your time. What these um, fundamentalists don't want you to know is that Adolf Hitler was a devout Catholic for most of his life. And with this Heinrich Himmler killing Jews, you won't find Paul Kurtz or you wouldn't have found Carl Sagan or me you know, or any other I secular know. humanist who goes along with the Humanist Manifesto condoning the brutal treatment that, that Hitler did. And as far as this town, I'd never heard of this before, this town of liberal Missouri, it sounds to me like it was not a failure of the Bible. It was a failure of secular law. They didn't have law. And they, you know, people there, you know, most people there were not philosophical atheists, I'm sure, just a few maybe, and most of them were just running amok. Like back in the 60s, you'd go to some kind of love-in or be-in and most people there were just, you know, there to have sex and do drugs. There was just a few that protested the Vietnam War and tried to make the world better. I do think, though, that over thousands of years, the world has been far better as we've gotten away from the old religions. I was getting ready to say when my time ran out before that James said, well, you know, these Muslims, we, we're not as bad as they are, even the hardcore fundamentalists and fanatics that we are with insisting every word in the Bible is true. And I said, well, that's true. Over in Nigeria, where they have Shara law, the most fundamental Muslims I know of, if a woman's been accused of adultery, they bury her up to her neck and then stone her to death. They shatter her head with grapefruit-sized rocks. And, of course, James and, and the rest of these guys, Norm Fields and Johnny Robertson, don't do that today. But why don't they? Doesn't the Bible tell them to do that? Don't they, aren't they supposed to stone a homosexual to death? Aren't they supposed to stone a disobedient, mouthy child to death? What stopped them? It was not holy men in the church. They never stopped anything. They didn't stop sawing lesbians in half. 
No, it was secular law, sane scientific men that said, let's get away from the old barbarism. The church can't take any credit for becoming more humane and getting away from human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, cannibalism, or any of the other slavery or any of the other barbarism. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about the horror of religion is war. If we're trying to convince the nations of the world not to have war, and the only way I know to do that would be to stop glorifying the uniform and the great hero, the great private who ran out with a machine gun and got shot down saving his comrades, or John McCain, supposed war hero in a, in a prison camp. He's no war hero. But, um, you know, or some general who's outflanked somebody else in the Civil War. We've got to stop glorifying war. And we need to tell all the children of all nations, don't put on a uniform, carry horrible weapons, and go kill other human beings. Stop it. But it's going to be hard to do that when the Bible's just full of war and Jehovah Almighty is pleased by these wars that his chosen people you know, commit on the, the Canaanites, or Ammonites, or I can't keep up with all those ites. It's crazy, silly to me. Um, anyway, I'd like to move on to abortion. I noticed when I was on last time, I came home, and uh, my wife was still watching James Oldfield's show, and I knew he was going to have some shocking pictures of bloody fetuses, and I also knew he wasn't going to call them fetuses. He was going to call them babies to get all the ignorant people wildly upset Play on the emotions. You see, that's a trick that the priest and, the, and the, the holy man and the witch doctor have always used. Get people emotionally worked up. I'm not for abortion. I am for birth control, but the church has always fought that. Margaret Sanger fought a good fight to get birth control to keep women from suffering so much and staying pregnant all the time with abusive husbands and things. And She and her father were both beat up repeatedly by church-going people. But if we'd use better birth control, we wouldn't have to get in these abortion situations. I don't think that we ought to, to kill a late-term fetus, certainly. But it's kind of a matter of the lesser of two evils. A fetus is alive, and you don't want to kill a living thing. But a fetus in the early stages cannot think. It's not nearly as cruel to kill a fetus as it is to kill a Canadian goose that's actually alive and we don't debate about whether it can think and feel. Early stage fetuses, and I tried to explain this to James and he couldn't understand it. I said, when I was a fetus myself, my brain had not formed. My, my myelin sheaths around my, my brain cells and my synapses are not formed enough for me to have an individual personality. So how can I panic and suffer? But as I said, I don't want to kill fetuses, but if, if it comes up to a choice of the lesser of two evils, are we going to let this child not be born at all? Or are we going to let this child grow up to, to kill your daughter? Now, last time James said, well, he, just, he wants to just decide. He's going to be his own law. He's going to say, well, kill them if they're poor. That's a lie. I didn't say that. I said, if you have a child that's unwanted, that's born to a mother that is going to neglect and abuse that child, and he's going to become a criminal, if I had to choose, I would choose him never to be born than to grow up in a life of crime and kill your daughter. That's, I think that's just horrible. I do not feel good about eating chicken. You've seen these things he showed from my letters to the paper. I hate hunting. I hate cruelty to animals. I really have a strong empathy with animals. I feel like they're my kin. But I do eat chicken. I'm a hypocrite. I can look right into this camera and tell you I'm a hypocrite. I'm kind of like Mark Childry on his cigarette smoking. I have tried so many times to become vegetarian, but I, my mother got me addicted to meat all during my childhood and my teenage years, and I, I keep backsliding. But I don't feel guilty when I eat an egg, folks, because an egg doesn't have a brain. My wife can scramble me up some eggs and make me an omelet, and I don't feel guilty. I feel guilty every time I eat bacon or barbecue or fish. Because those animals were alive and wanted to live, I feel bad about it. I have a moral dilemma there. But I don't feel bad about killing an egg and eating it because an egg's not a brain. And I think that's the way for the early-term fetus. It, it, the question, folks, is can it suffer? Now, I know these preachers are going to show you all these bloody fetuses. and Oh, he says he cares about living things. But these fetuses cannot suffer. And that is the fundamental lie. When I, when I ride around Eden and see these big signs saying abortion is murder, I think, no, it's not. It's bombing the children in, in Iraq and Vietnam and Japan is murder. Uh, these people that are so religious 
and so much on the Bible, and hate abortion so bad, do not seem to me to care too much about actual children, about which there is no doubt about whether they can suffer or not. They bomb people all over the world, but they'll find a way to justify that. That's justice. And they'll, they'll twist the Bible and twist Jesus' Sermon on the Mount around if they have to and, and say that. But that's, that's crazy. Uh, speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, I guess you've noticed that a lot of fanatical religious people want the Ten Commandments inscribed on the walls of public buildings, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever seen one of them try to get the Sermon on the Mount up there? <laughs> Isn't that a joke? Can you imagine... Let's go to the Pentagon. Up on the walls of the Pentagon, they carve into the wall, blessed are the peacemakers. That wouldn't go good with Lockheed Martin and the other people that make trillions of dollars selling weapons of war. What about if we went to the New York Stock Exchange? The New York Stock Exchange, and on the wall we had, blessed are the poor. That wouldn't go too good either. Wouldn't go too good with Joel Osteen and the other jerk preachers that are telling us God wants us to be billionaires. Crazy stuff. Just crazy stuff. So when they want to use with me an argument against abortion by saying, you know, you say you care about a blackbird. I told a story that I shot a blackbird, and I'd always been doing that. And this particular one, I had an, an epiphany. I was struck with a bolt of lightning through the head, and I didn't think it was a god or a devil. I simply realized this bird was my kin. We're all in this together. That bird wanted to live. It wanted to fly away with his friends. And I felt terrible about it. I took my pellet gun I'd shot it with and beat it against the foundation of the house to just you couldn't recognize it anymore. But James jumped me. He said, well, are you going to care more about a bird than a baby? Well, no. No. We've got to protect babies. But a fetus, an early term fetus, yeah, I care more about a blackbird than I do a first trimester fetus because the blackbird can suffer. Come to your senses, people. Stop letting these preachers brainwash you and hypnotize you with nonsense and fables from the ancient times. An early term fetus does not have a fully constructed brain. The structure and wiring of the brain is not such that it can suffer. A blackbird clearly can suffer. At least, maybe I'm being anthropomorphic again. Maybe I'm applying my standards to the bird. But as far as saying that everybody's a law unto himself, this, as I said before, most people are not atheists or agnostics or skeptical humanists. The people that get out and run amok and commit crimes, they're not thinkers. As I said about this, this town of um, liberal Missouri, most of those people there were not sane, philosophical, contemplative, thoughtful people that were criticizing the Bible and religion and looking at it honestly and seeing all the bloodshed and crazy madness in it, all the crazy things in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers that are just sickening. They weren't looking at all that. They, they, you know, they didn't care about that. They probably believed in that bloody God. If you ask them, I'm sure most, most of them really deep down did. They weren't. You know, just a few were there trying to break away from... Okay, time up. <clears throat> all right, well... Uh... I just want to go back to uh, what he was saying about the uh, world. He said the world's a far better place uh, since time has been going. I guess we're getting away from religion and, and the world's a far better place. Uh, I think if you do your checking, uh, death rates are up, murder rates are up. Uh, all the things that point to a better world are really not better. As a matter of fact, we've been going how many years the evolution says billions and billions of years, and we haven't reached utopia yet. When do we ever get to utopia? When do we get to the point that we evolved where there is nothing bad? But actually, if you look at the world, world clock and you see how many people are dying or starving, they're, they're being killed and so forth, the world's not being a better place. It's becoming more corrupt. I submit to you it's because we're getting away from religion. I agree that we're getting away from the true standard of God of right and wrong, and we're not adhering to it. Now, as far as abortion goes, you know, uh, the idea that uh, he was a fetus, and so uh, Mr. Serber says he was a, he was a fetus, and, and he didn't, uh, uh, what you said as a former fetus, when we were talking to you at your house, you said as a former fetus, you didn't have any feelings. Or you no. Uh, I said I didn't know I was alive. Okay. Well, but does, it, does, does knowing... Having a conscience about whether you're alive or not, does that determine how we affect something? 
Is it living? You see, that's, that's, the, that's the question we want to ask. Is that fetus, that first term fetus, is it alive? You know, uh, you remember the article that Mr. Uh, Serber wrote in, uh, uh, to, the letter, to the letter to the editor about uh, not hurting living things? Uh, he said, let's, uh, let's see, what's the exact quote? Uh, Hurting living things is not wholesome. Well, I submit to you, friends, that a fetus is alive whether it recognizes it's alive or not. And whether it has a brain or not, it's still alive. And, you know, the fact that people don't accept that it's alive, why do you think, why do you think people buy condoms? It's because they know when life begins. Deep down, you know when life begins. You see, that fetus starts growing, and that's alive. And so it doesn't really matter if it, if it knows or not. The point is, when does it start living? And Mr. Uh, Mr. Serber would say, Let's, you know, don't do any harm to any living thing. So wouldn't a fetus be a living thing? I submit to you that this idea of making a distinction, let's kill a late term. You know, late term's not good, but early term is good. Well, he did say that there was a time, there was a condition when he wouldn't, or when he would uh, uh, say uh, abortion. And I'm saying as a humanist, the Humanist Manifesto affirms, let's, let's have abortion. Well, is there a time when you would uh, uh, abort a baby? He said there was a time when you'd abort a baby. He said if, if you knew that it was going to grow up and uh, kill someone's daughter, or you knew it was going to uh, grow up and be an evil person, I suppose, I'm paraphrasing, then he would choose that it never be born. My friends, as an empirical uh, evidence seeker, how does he know whether it's going to be, what it's going to grow up to be like? How does he know what this child is going to grow up to be like? Yes, a child, how does he know what it's going to grow up to be like? Why not something better? Why not we just wait, go ahead and have the baby, let it be born in poverty, let it be born to people who don't want it, and then let's just see when it gets 10, 12 years old, then let's kill it. You see? Let's go ahead and, and, and kill it because then we know for sure. See, now we have empirical evidence to know whether it's really going to be productive or not productive. You see? Now, when he called in to talk to Norm, he criticized the idea that when God... Uh, killed a group of people who were wicked, whose, whose wickedness was full, as a just God, and, he's, and he chastises the idea of justice, I suppose. But listen to what he says. Two weeks ago, I called into James Oldfield's show when he was on the air, and we talked, and I ran over into um, Norm Fields' show, and Norm Fields talked for a while about some of the things I'd said. One of the things I had said to James was, this God of the Bible, your Jehovah, the God of the chosen people, did some horrible things to the unchosen people, the other 99% of the people. He told them to uh, kill every man, woman, and child of some tribes. And Norm came on and said, yes, that's true, but he did it to save them from a fate worse than death because those, I forgot who he said, the Ammonites or some ites. He said, those people worship Moloch. And they had a big idol to Moloch, and sometimes they would put children in this big copper spoon mouth of the idol and burn them up. So we were saving them from that fate by going ahead and killing them. What if Hitler had used that argument? What if Hitler had used the same argument Norm Fields used and said, well, yeah, I killed six million Jews, but my heart was in the right place, you see. I killed them to save them from growing up into a life of Judaism. And, you know, having that horrible stuff like having a mole do a bris on them and circumcise them with his teeth or some horrible abomination. I don't think, though, in modern times we would buy that argument from Hitler. And I should say we should not buy that argument that Norm Fields made for ancient times either. All right. So we shouldn't buy the argument that God uh, can kill children. Now, I certainly wouldn't let Hitler have the argument because Hitler is not a, an objective determine, uh, rule of right or wrong. But, but you see, but then we turn over here to Mr. Serber, and he actually says, well, there is a time when... We could make that decision. You see, there's a time when there, it would be just to kill it. And I'm saying, well, why? It's because it's the situation. You see, situation ethics says, well, there is a time to kill it. And I'm saying if we recognize there is a higher moral authority, an objective standard of right and wrong, 
then we then can say, let him be the determination of what's, what's just and unjust. And we strive to adhere to those rules and we too can make the same just uh, judgments as well. But we would, never, we would never say, well, depending on the situation. You see? So, no, we can make the same just uh, judgments as well. But we would, never, we would never say, well, depending on the situation. You see? So, no, life doesn't get better when we leave religious uh, authority. It gets worse because people start doing what they want to do. And I, you know, he can, we can argue this all, all, all night long about what's horrible. But you see, the very fact that Mr. Serber uses terms like horrible and evil and uh, good and bad shows that somewhere he has to have an idea. There has to be a standard of right and wrong. Now, he said this about the killing of innocent women who were thought to be witches. Now, this Benet's Reader's Encyclopedia right here has an article on witches. And as I look at it, it says that calculations have shown more than 9 million women and girls were put to death because they were believed to be witches. Innocent women and girls put to death because they were thought to be witches, and the Bible said they were witches, and the Bible said they should be put to death. I find that horrible beyond belief. All right, I find it horrible beyond belief. But then, you see, he has to say about the abortions. Now, all right, let's, let's talk about this. I know you don't like this, uh, Larry, but... Let's just let's just take this figure. Now, not all of these, not all, not not all of these are early term abortions. Surely we can agree with that. Not all of these are first trimester abortions. So, is that horrible beyond belief? You see, why is it that we're horrified at at uh, uh, misunderstanding, misguided individuals putting to death innocent people because they thought they're witches, but yet we actually profess that, you know what, there is a situation where an innocent person, an innocent child in the, who can think, we'll just go ahead and say that, who can think, I'll try to use your terms, who can think uh, in, the, in the late, in the late uh, parts of life, growing, living, uh, being are put to death. You see? And I'm saying this is, this is the double standard that you get when you get situation ethics when everybody is subjective to do what they want to do it does not promote good things and how do you know that all these individuals who are aborted so you don't know that they were going to grow up to be mean and wicked and, and terrible individuals as a matter of fact most of the people who most of the uh, children who are aborted are the fetuses that are aborted I'll give you his term most of the fetuses that are aborted you know what they're not aborted because they're born into poor or are uh, unwanted families like that, they're aborted because of inconvenience. You see, the individuals are prom promiscuous. They don't want to have their sexual desires repressed, like the uh, humanist says. And then they say, well, now we have some consequences here, so let's get rid of this consequence of our uninhibited behavior. And I'm saying, friends, that is the downfall of our society. Okay. Uh, we're on uh, questions, uh, Larry. Um, let's see. We're going to have 20 minutes of uh, questions, and uh, I don't. Uh, I don't really have a preference. If you want to go first or ask the first question, we're going to try to, uh, folks. We're going to try to. Uh, be decently in order in this and uh, take turns asking questions and then maybe have a little rebuttal uh, to each other if we want, you know, ask a question and then I'll respond and then you can have a response to my response. But we're going to try to do this a very expedient way. I think Brandon's going to keep uh, so ten, 10 minutes, Mark. You, 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 you start the clock when I'm talking and Brandon will uh, keep time for, for Larry. And then that way we don't use up our time. We'll see how that goes. We're, we're going to play this kind of by ear. But So uh, <clears throat> do you want to start with the first question? Larry? I would like to, but okay. I would like to say one quick thing. Okay. James cannot let it go. He's got to call a fetus a child. And I said there's just horrible that they kill these children that can think. Not as horrible to kill a fetus that can't think. And it doesn't know it's alive. Okay, my first question. 
Uh, it's going to take a moment for this, so I may not get to ask as many questions, but if you'll bear with that's, me. That's fine. My first question is, is this, James. Um, if you were to get really angry with me, you know, maybe we had a misunderstanding or for some reason I did something really stupid and awful to you, and you just lost it. You just you weren't yourself, and you killed me. Well, obviously, if you kill me, I'm going directly to hell as soon as I die. There's no more chances for me, right? <clears throat> okay. And, you know, I said before I was a Methodist, so I was sprinkled and not immersed, so you know I'm going straight to hell as soon as you murder me. You're sending me to hell. But let's say, on the other hand, you get into an argument with Johnny Robertson who believes as you do because of his beliefs, when you lose your temper with him and somehow kill him, he's going straight to heaven. My question to you is, as a moral philosophical question, and I want you to wrestle with this for a moment, right. have you committed a worse sin by killing me, knowing I'm going straight to hell because of my beliefs, or have you done a worse sin by killing Johnny Robertson and knowing he's going straight to heaven where he wants to go anyway? I'd like you to answer that. Well, either way, murder would be, would be bad. I mean, it, it, Which is worse. Well, I don't know that there would be a worse. I guess it would be worse in the sense of you hadn't obeyed the gospel, but that's, that's the whole point of saying let's have a standard of right and wrong. I'm going to try to adhere to a system that says I need to be in control. You see, the Bible, the, the Bible tells me to be in control of my temper, to be in control of my anger, so I would hope that if I'm practicing that, if I'm practicing that, then I'm not going to be angry with you to the point that I kill you, nor with Johnny. You see, that's my, my whole point is, if, if, now if I don't have, if I don't believe that though, Larry, see, if I don't believe that there's a right and wrong, good or evil, then I'm not really worried about it. See? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be in hell with you for killing either you or Johnny if I am not regulated by the higher moral standard. I don't think you've answered my question, James. Well, Is it a worse sin to kill a guy and send him to hell or a worse sin to kill a guy and send him to heaven? Regardless of whether you end up in hell for murder or not, thou shalt not kill. I'm just saying... Wouldn't it be worse to kill me, the, the atheist or agnostic or whatever you say? You say, I don't, can't say there's absolutely no God. But it seems to me like in an abstract sense, it might be worse for you to kill me and send me to hell because you know hell's terrible. You've got the brimstone and mm -hmm. the horns and, man, it's right. awful. Well, Aren't I, you just I, sending Johnny up to heaven? He ought to like that. I don't know. I, get, I mean, you would say, yeah, I'm sure, it's, it's worse if I kill you. I mean, I don't know what difference that makes. I mean, the consequence is just a you, philosophical. You lose your soul. Uh, I guess. I guess if I tried to, if I, if you wouldn't obey the gospel, then then uh, the Lord would have mercy on me because and you, He knew you was hard headed. You, right, and you don't know that I might not have converted if you hadn't killed me, James. You're, you're right. I might have seen the light, and I might have, um, you know, been convinced that there is an Almighty God, and I might have changed my ways, and I might have gotten immersed. And I might have done all the things to accept Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior, and I might have gone to heaven, but you kill me yeah. and deny me that chance. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give you a chance just here okay. in a minute to convince me there's a God. So you okay. go ahead and ask me your okay. question. All right. <clears throat> uh, in the humanist world, here, here's my question. In the humanist world, does everyone get to be their own God? In other words, standard, they get to determine what's right and wrong. And if not, what's, what is the standard of right and wrong? Can I get over here sure, and be sure. seen in front of what you... Uh, in the humanist world, does everyone get to be their own God? No. The socialists... I like socialism, and you all hate it. In the socialist world where everybody... You know, you can't afford to... Everybody can't afford to buy their own fire truck. So socialism says as a community, we'll buy one fire truck, and then occasionally when somebody needs it with their house on fire, then that fire truck will be there for us. That's socialism. I asked my kids at school one time, what's socialism? They said, it's where the secret police kick your door down at night. See, they've been brainwashed by the capitalist system. Today, the socialist countries of Canada, France, Sweden, they, you know, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, they, they have 
a lot more peace and less gun violence and things than, than we do. No, the humanist world does not get to be their own God because we don't believe in a God. We don't believe in the supernatural. We believe everything's part of nature. Everything. We don't believe in anything supernatural. We may not understand it. As I said, you may not... If your car, if you don't understand how a car engine works, you still don't have to believe that a car, your car goes down the street because God's blowing on it. We can understand some things. No, we don't believe, no secular humanist has thoroughly thought this out, believes there is a God. And if not, what is the standard of right and wrong? And as I said before, the standard of right and wrong is being a human, having an affinity for other humans and other living things, and having a conscience. That's the way I see it. But if... <clears throat> But if within that society, in that social society, one of the one of the humans doesn't adhere to to the rules, in other words, they don't they don't really care about your well being, and they want to impose their their will upon you, how can you say that's wrong? Because you you name some socialist countries here. What about Russia and China and North Korea, where they do have oppressive governments because it is a socialist country where one man is making the rules, or one man or one, one small group of people, and imposing upon a, a, a life upon people that, you know, don't really want that. I don't call those socialist countries, James. I call those dictatorships. Of, I don't think the Soviet Union ever met the ideal of being truly socialist, communist. There was a lot of corruption there. But no, I know what you're saying. You're saying that maybe I've got a high moral standard and I can just live with my conscience and I don't need God or the judge or the prison. But most people don't. They're going to run amok. I don't think they run amok because of getting away from the Bible. And I do maintain that we're a lot better people than we were 3,000 years ago when there was all these human sacrifices, cannibalisms, and slaughters. I think we're, even though you may say that since the 60s we've had an increase, and I was one of those hippies in the 60s, I'll have to take some blame for it. But I think that, you know, you can say maybe it goes up and down over, over time. Maybe we're a little worse off in some ways than we were in the 60s or before. But also some people are a lot better off. The blacks, the women, people that were oppressed, I think, I think they're better off. Okay. Okay, I mentioned um, a few moments. Can I stand in front of your yeah, humanist yeah, world yeah, here? Yeah. Okay. I mentioned a little while ago that I said I'm going to give you a chance to convince me, and hey, I'm not Sheik Nora Dean or some silly clown. I'm sincere about this, and I'm not playing. Hey, this is a sincere philosophical question. I want you to be able to demonstrate to me, so maybe I won't go to hell, that you've got a real product. I said when I was on here before, I said, why use violence, terrorism, and force to force people? Why have the priests always forced people to believe in their God. Otherwise, they'd kill them for blasphemy or heresy or something. I said, it's because they can't demonstrate their product. You can't call your God out and have him jump down and perform on cue. And if I say, you know, ask you to, you'll say, well, our God doesn't act that way. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to do something a little different. I want you, James, like the prophets of old, I want you to pray sincerely to your God, on my behalf. And on behalf of however many people are watching this show out here in the Star News viewing area, out here in TV land. I want you to pray for his guidance. As I say, like the prophets of old, I want you to find some inspiration. I want you to call upon God who is real and everywhere at all times and is hearing me and hearing you right now. And I want you to do something that will demonstrate to me beyond all doubt that God exists. And if you can do this, I will <clears throat> fall to my knees on this plywood platform, and for the rest of my life I will praise Jehovah. You can bet on it. And this is what I ask. Before I came over here, I took this little newspaper, and this is one of these liberal socialist newspapers. It's got Jim Hightower from Texas who criticizes the big corporations. Before I came over here, I went to page nine in this paper and I made a little orange magic marker rectangle around about six or seven lines in here. What I want you to do is ask God from the bottom of your heart to tell you what it says. And I don't want any of these psychic things where you say, oh, I think I'm seeing a famous person. Is this person in trouble? I want you to tell me the name of the person that's in this box 
and what they said. If you can do that, then you can demonstrate your God. If you cannot, then I was right when I said all these violent priests and tearing tongues out and sawing women in half was because they couldn't demonstrate their product. So, the no. ball's in your court, James. <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't have to, I'm not going to, number one, be able to do that, and number two, even, even if I could, I don't know that I would. Here's it's important, why. though. God could save well, me right but here's here. The thing, though. Here's the thing, though. You, you're asking me to prove the product that I believe to you in a way that God doesn't tell me to prove it to you. Here, here's what I'm saying. The Bible says in, Rome, in Romans 1.16, and now I'm using the product. See, I'm using the product. I'm, I'm following the direction. The Bible says, "For the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is power to God and salvation to everyone that believeth the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the righteousness of God is revealed in his word. Now, if you aren't going to accept that there is a God, then why would I try to convince you I will By accept his it instructions. I will, I, will, I will accept it when you convince me. Okay. But why would I try to convince you that he wrote a book that is the instructions on what you need to do to be saved if you don't even accept that there is a God who is above all and in charge of all? You see, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to jump through hoops to demonstrate to you when God says, look, if you want to convince Larry Serber that I am real, uh, you're going to do it by what is revealed here. And so, you know, it's like you're asking me to do something that, I, that I'm not... You're not you capable know. of doing it. That's right. All right. So see, this is the difference between a religious man, a holy man, a witch doctor, and a scientist. Scientists say, prove it, not just something that happened a long time ago in an old book, but something that we can set up in laboratory repeatable experiments where all of us can agree and he can demonstrate. He didn't demonstrate. May I read to you what I had, had done here? What I had was right here, and it says, President Harry Truman spoke to the American public three days after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Calling the civilian field Japanese city a military base, Truman said the world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. We did that because we wished this first attack to avoid the killing of civilians. Harry Truman lied like a dog. He killed a whole city full of old women in wheelchairs. and stuff. So you couldn't, I guess, you know, I'll, look, I'll look right into the camera here. Folks, James Allfield was not able to demonstrate and, and you know, convince me there's a God. You know he didn't. He's got his, he's got his little rig and rub out. Oh, we've got to go through this Bible. Why would I do it? He could not do it. Remember that if you don't remember anything okay. else tonight. He could not demonstrate okay. his right. God. You're taking up my time now. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, go ahead with your next question. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, you stated... And I really had some other questions I want to ask. I don't run out of time. You stated in our discussion at your house on Monday that you accepted the immutable laws of science and nature. I, that, that was from my notes. I hope I'm. Uh, is spontaneous generation uh, possible? That is, living from non living? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, the Russian scientists set up the, the primordial atmosphere and they, they tried to recreate the uh, the you know, there's only about a hundred known natural elements, you know, and they, they're all, every atom of every one of them is the same, and they set up this primordial atmosphere like in the ancient earth, and there was a spark. I'm not sure if it was an accidental thing or something, but there was a spark. They came back the next morning, and there was brown scum there, and this, what this was was like a, a one-celled life that could replicate itself. That's why it covered the okay. sides of the okay. jar. Yeah, I think spontaneous <clears throat> okay. so, life from non-life so, does that. So can you demonstrate that? Yes, the Russians demonstrated no, it. Can you do it? I could if I had the equipment here, okay. James. I'm just can be see, done. Here, this is science. I want, here's what I want you to see, friends. We're, we're talking about demonstrating. I mean, he wanted to test me, so I'm going to test him. Uh, the fact that he says that life can come from something non-living tells me that even the humanist, like like Mr. Serber, agrees in something supernatural. Because in the beginning, in the beginning, if there was life, you know, he says there was life in the beginning. There had to be something living in the beginning. Hmm. So, I mean, abiogenesis just doesn't work. Because it, 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 even the, in the Petri dish or in the experiments, these individuals, these individuals were the 
impetus. In other words, they, they, put the, they put the elements together. You have to explain where the elements came from. You have to explain the, the energy that they used to get this spontaneous generation. And nowhere else, nowhere else in, 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 uh, in, the, in life, I guess, can you demonstrate life coming from non-living matter. Well, I'm trying to say that this was a stunning and startling thing they did discover. They had just hydrogen, carbon, and things that were not alive, and it became able to replicate itself, and replicating two made four and four made eight, and this is, this is what but where I think the universe... Where did those elements it, come from? Well, the elements have always been here. The elements, the fundamental elements of the universe, I don't care if it's an atom of hydrogen in the sun or in my kneecap, it's still a hydrogen atom. Okay. And as far as I'm concerned, they've always been here. Now, friends, I just want you to see this. This is, this is what we're dealing with. Mr. Serber says the elements have always been here, and I just want to, to just put this in your mind. Uh, and I'm going to take a little more time because we went long on one of your questions. <clears throat> he says the elements have always been here. In other words, non-living matter has always been here. Now you tell me, now he calls religion childish and superstitious. Now you, you, you just think of yourself, which one is more childish and more superstitious? An eternal living being, God, creating non-living matter. Now wait a minute. Or non-living matter creating something that's living. An eternal mind or eternal matter? Mr. Serber wants to say we came from dust and rocks that's non-living and all of a sudden life came? Or living a life created the non-living as well as other living things? Now, you know, if he wants to say uh, matter's eternal, why is that not childish but yet saying that there is a God, an eternal God, see, why is that childish? It's all because if he accepts or if he missed that, that the life that created all things is God, then he has to then conform to his will. And that gets back to that humanist. I don't want an, an objective authority telling me or dictating me what's right and wrong and controlling me, repressing me. So, you know, you, you can say believing in, in uh, a creator is childish, but, I mean, it's just as childish for you to say there, there's, there was no life out there and all of a sudden it just popped up. I'll tell you why it's childish because what I said earlier, the anthropomorphic view. We look at nature and all evidence shows us it's just <coughs> grinding on. You look at nature and say it had to be like a big man, a creator, like Geppetto made Pinocchio the puppet. That's why it's childish. Okay, is it time for me to ask another question? No, we're, uh, we're down to phone calls now. Gosh, I wish I could ask <coughs> one more. I know, I do too. <laughs> uh, all right, folks, we're going we're gonna to take some phone calls. I meant to, I meant to get to that earlier. Uh, let me remind you again, please, to uh, uh, have, have your questions in mind, if you don't matter, if you don't mind, uh, because we're, you know, we're going to try to expedite things, all right? You're on the word from the Lord. Welcome to the program. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Server. Uh, I assume he believes in evolution. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, but you also said that science has to have repeatable laboratory experiments for proof. Are there any repeatable laboratory experiments for evolution? You, you really ought to read four books by Charles Darwin, and I know it's a tough assignment, but read The Origin of Species, The Descent of Man, uh, the expression of emotions in man and animals, and above all, the voyage of the beagle. You will begin to see the processes of evolution. Also read some good modern biologists like Richard Dawkins of Oxford University. He will explain to you in terms like making a cake. He will say things to you like, if I put in the eggs, the flour, the butter, the sugar, and I bake a cake, make it go through a chemical change. So it's not just a physical change. It becomes something diff a different <clears throat> substance. Then he's going to say things like, can you pick out one of these crumbs and say this is an egg crumb and this is a butter crumb? It, he will explain things in simple terms that you can have around the house. Absolutely, I believe in evolution. I, it is, I think it is a fact. I, you know, I wouldn't bet my life on all of it. But, but you still haven't answered the question. Are there laboratory repeatable experiments? Certainly. 
Certainly, you, you can show things. That, a good example, now you might not be inside the confines of a laboratory because it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't lend itself to this, but you can show butterflies that used to be light that are now dark because all of the light ones died out when London was covered with soot and they became much more visible. Their camouflage was ruined. And so they didn't have any offspring. This is just what evolution but that's does. That's not evolution. That's not evolution. That's that's natural selection. It's adaption, no, adaptation yeah, to the right. environment. But, but but see, the thing is, they're still butterflies, or they're still moths. They don't they don't change from species to species. You have to prove that that it changes from species to species. When, whenever all the white moths died out, there were obviously there weren't going to be any more white moths because their genes didn't pass on. That white gene didn't pass on. But they're still moths. They're still moths. That's why in in parts of the world, like in, in, in Africa, there's predominantly more uh, dark-skinned individuals because they're better adapted to the bright sunlight, whereas in the far north, in you know, in, in uh, the, Nether the Netherlands or, or Sweden or whatever, Norway, you know, there's more blonde-haired because they can get by with less, less sun. Okay. The moths were a bad example on that. But we do have fossil evidence. And by the way, only one out of a billion plants or animals actually okay. fossilizes. Laboratory experiment. You said that science is based on laboratory. Well, I said science is based on experiment. <clears throat> I don't know that I said laboratory. If I did, I misspoke. Not all science. You can't do laboratory experiments about the rotation of the sun. You can't do laboratory experiments okay. about, the, you know, experiments about <clears throat> the gravitational forces on the moon. But I am saying that there are there is fossil evidence that there were animals like fish that that like the coelacanth, we, we thought that had been extinct for millions of years when they <coughs> caught one, that animals that have vestigial legs where they began to make the transition from the sea to the land. It was an adapt. It was like James said, it was, a, it was an adaptation to pressures from the environment, but they did actually change but, from but one you, species to another. But you can't find them missing link. But you can't oh, find yes. Them. Yes, there are, there are a Thanks lot of transitional call, links. Thanks for your call. Uh, <coughs> all right, you're on the word from the Lord. Hello. Hello. Um, you've heard of laminin? Heard of who? Laminin. Laminin? L-A-M-I-N-I-N. I don't recall it. It's the molecule that holds the human body together. Uh, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that right now. Maybe I've read, read about that, that you're saying that there is one molecule, like a, like a, water molecule or something that several atoms bonded by a chemical bond and it holds the human body together as a whole, all the cells, all the different types of cells? I've not heard of this. Where did you hear this? Um, I got it off of the computer on the internet. Did um, you get it off some religious site? It was um, actually off of YouTube. Um, it had to be true. It was a preacher that preached about a scientist that had talked to him and he said that there was a molecule. He told the same thing that you did. Um, his name was um, Louis Gilio, Gilio, and he told the same thing that you did, about 12 days equals a million seconds. And he showed a picture of the molecule laminin. Without it, you would just fall apart, your whole body. With nothing would stay together. It's the glue that holds the human body together. And when they showed the picture of it, they had separated it from all the other molecules, and the picture of it um, crossed. It's shaped like a cross. And um, well, ma'am, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not real sure what 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 the point is. But I mean, just I, I don't know if you're saying that it's just because it's shaped like a, a cross or something. That is that. That's proof a, that um, creation to me. That's proof. That's even further proof that God made us. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't even know if that I would. Uh, uh, you know, go with that. That's. I mean, that's that, like that talking that in proof. tongues. Yeah, I, I appreciate your call, ma'am. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't know. You know, one of the things, I'll just say this, Larry, one of the things that, that I'm going to say to the community is one of the things, folks out there, that uh, I think causes individuals like Larry to be more uh, devout or more affirmed in what he believes is because all of the foolishness and the folly that is seen in religion. Jesus' you know? face so, and a loaf of bread. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, or the, the grilled cheese sandwich. I, you know, Jesus' that, face on a grilled cheese sandwich. That sold for $28,000, and I, for $28,000, I could sell people a lot of grilled cheese sandwiches. Oh, I could too. So, okay, you're on the word from the Lord. I'd like to know how Mr. Serber knew that uh, the fetus didn't 
feel something. Because I was a fetus myself once, and I can tell you I was not aware of my own existence at that point. And I think that's what the big hubbub about killing a fetus or killing a baby is. Baby, when I was a fetus, I had not formed a consciousness yet. I did not even <clears throat> know that I was alive. I was no more alive than my thumb. My thumb is alive. What about a sperm? How far back are we going to go? Is a sperm alive? you ever seen one swimming around in a fluid? Well, yeah. I do well, know that I used to sit a glass of water on my stomach, and I could feel the baby kick. You mean the, the, the baby would kick and the water would vibrate? That does yeah. not defy the laws of physics or nature. That's not supernatural. <clears throat> no, but it kick, did water. that water. I don't think she's saying it is supernatural. Oh. But, well, I, well I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I mean, Larry, Larry, I mean, he always talks about empirical evidence. I mean, let's let's prove that you didn't know that. I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't remember since I was born, you know. I mean, when I was one year old, I don't remember some things that, that happened. You don't know much but, until you got but, language. But, but that doesn't mean but that doesn't mean I wasn't alive then. And no, you a, were alive. I know, but, but I just don't because deny I can't that. remember it. I don't how, deny I mean, how, do you, how do you know you didn't know something in, in the, as a fetus? Can, can you demonstrate that? Is no, you've got me there. So, but but I've never said that a fetus was not alive, and I did not say that it's a good thing to abort a fetus. I just said in some circumstances when somebody doesn't want a baby, I would prefer if I had to choose just two things between it being born to an un, in a, where a situation where it's not wanted and grow up to be a criminal and kill my daughter, or just have it not even be born, then that's a hard choice. Well, but it's, it is alive. Yeah, you are killing yeah. something. You're killing well, a living but, thing. But, and, and that's my saying. That's my thing, though. You, you know, you, you didn't like it when Norm said that about God. No, it seems you know, crazy for a loving, so, all-powerful God to go around slaughtering but, but his own read, people. When you read in the Old Testament, do you, do you read about the love in the Old Testament? So yes. You, you, you read about a lot of the, a lot of the, the killing and everything. And a lot of the killing that went on in the Old Testament, too, was, was not God's people. You, you read Psalm 130, what, 130, 137, Seven, nine, verse 9, nine yeah. where he says, um, Blessed are those heads. who bash the heads yeah. of the Babylonian and babies who, against the that stones. Was? That, that was the Middle Persians. Oh, I didn't see? know. See? So, but that so, was David, though, that sawed people in half all the time. <laughs> well, but my point is, you know, he can't demonstrate that as a fetus he didn't know those things. And I'll say this, as a former fetus, I could say that I did remember it. And... You, you don't know. remember it, though. You know How you do you know? Because you're going to tell me the truth. You're going to look at me and tell me I don't remember it, James. You, you're an honest but man. Saying, as, as a former fetus, you say as a former fetus, you, 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 know, you know these things. Well, I didn't say I know. I said I have a strong feeling. And what we know about, about the brain now. Well, let's, let's let this lady talk. No, let's, let's move on to another call. All right, We're bye, bye. Th Thanks for your call. Uh, so uh, you're on the work of the Lord. Yeah, thank you, sir. James, you, I tell you what, buddy, you you doing a fine job, uh, a real fine job. All right, can, uh, can we're trying to we're trying to move on with the questions. Okay, uh, this man here said talking about Matt and Mass. Okay, he said they after you was tell, talking about was nobody here, this that, and the other. He said they, therefore he knows there's a higher power. He knows that in his heart. Okay, no. as no. big as this man is right here. Okay, you know common sense tell you when you was born. You didn't know how to raise no corn. You didn't know how to plant no garden. You had to live off of the land. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, I was not a farmer, but I could be taught that by human beings. I have no, I have no belief in a Jehovah any more than I do a Zeus or a Thor or a Kronos or any of the other gods people made up. That's just silly fairy tales. It's like Santa Claus or leprechauns. George Carlin said, sir, he said, I th heard recently that 80% of Americans believe in angels. And he laughed and he said, what are they, stupid? What percent of them believe in zombies? How about uh, goblins? What about leprechauns? I don't believe in any supernatural things at all. I think it's silly. And you, I don't, you say I must have known a higher power. The only higher power I know is the universe, and it doesn't care about me. It just grinds on, and I'm going to die and be gone, and I'm going to live the best life I can in between. Okay. So if, it didn't, if it didn't care about you, you wouldn't be here. Well, that's no. your belief. Okay. Thanks for your call. Thank you. You want to work from the Lord? Uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, how can we explain away all those eyewitness accounts when Jesus and even some of his disciples brought the dead people back to life? I think that's you. Uh, that's an old book that happened a long time ago. I asked James a while ago to demonstrate God by reading this thing here. Are you there? No, I, I, I think I'm hung up. Well, well just because, but, but Larry, just because you want you want a certain demonstration, 
I mean, in the here and now, not something that somebody said a long time ago. See, what we're getting through, friends, is the ingrained idea of I'm I'm going to get what I want. You see, I mean, Larry's not God. I mean, I know he he wants to be his own God. Well, I just want to be honest. I want the truth at all costs. Larry. I, I want the truth at all costs, and I will dig, and I will have no no faith. I will have nothing. It's proved to me in a demonstration that I can believe that will convince me. Something that, You can write anything in an old book a long time ago. I've told you, James, I thought the Bible was written by ignorant desert men. I said to you, why didn't they predict uh, nylon? Why didn't they predict North America? Why didn't they predict microbes? And, and but here's the thing, though, Larry. Just because something is not written in the Bible in the terms you think it should be written does not mean it's not there. But you said to me, the Bible's not Nostradamus or some prophet nut. You said the Bible didn't work that way, didn't prophesy things for my benefit to to gratify me. But then you turned around and said the Bible did prophesy things. I said, why don't you chop off the Jew Bible, the Old Testament, with all these horrible atrocities in it? You said this the other day at my house. I said, why don't you take some scissors and chop off the Jew Bible, because that's where most of the most horrible, crazy stuff is. And you said, we can't do that because it contains prophecies of the coming of Jesus. So how's it going to be, James? You want the prophecies or you don't want the prophecies? prophecies, not, Not prophecies of nylon. I mean, so you, I want prophecies that would demonstrate actually, these weren't ignorant men, and I'm, you can't I'm show saying, me. And they're there, and they're there if you if you'll accept them. But I'm I saying don't when, I, when I present them, are you going to accept them even though they may not be in the terms you expect? I'll them accept to be? them if they're convincing. Now you said when I said the the biblical men didn't even know the earth was a ball. You put up on the screen something about the, in the circle of the earth. Well, a circle's not a sphere. And Eratosthenes, the librarian at the great library at Alexandria. 2,300 years ago, 300 years before the birth of Christ, not only showed that the earth was a sphere, he measured it using science and mathematics. He measured the circumference of the earth to great precision within a few meters. So what are you saying? It's amazing. I'm just saying that they could have had things in the Bible to convince me it wasn't written by ordinary men, that it was inspired and dictated by a divine God. There is nothing that I've read in the Bible and nothing you've told me that convinces me there's any big guy like a... A, a creator that creates whole universes. Well, I will, I will, I will, dem- I will do that. I will do that in either coming lessons or either I'll come to your house and we'll, we'll have. Bible I would like love that. to hear. It. I mean, in these, you know, in the time we have here, you know, I, I can take up the rest of the time. So, all right, let's see. You're on the word from the Lord, Mr. Serber. Yes. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. Abraham Lincoln. I disagree with Abraham Lincoln. The people that wrote the Bible thought the stars were just right overhead and they were put there for our benefit. We now know there are trillions of light years apart between the billions of galaxies and stars. I can look up there and see all that stuff turning around, and I don't think it was made for me. <clears throat> I don't look. He you know, gave us know. a will. We can either believe him or not. He gave us a will. Right, and I'd, I'd choose not to believe him because I haven't seen hey, any evidence, and I don't think Abraham Lincoln was Good. right. Good night. Good night. You're Lord. Hey, Mr. Oldfield, thanks for hosting this. This has been wonderful. Um, my my question is, uh, th- what, what does the Bible say really about capital punishment? Capital punishment. Yeah, like, you know, God kills somebody, should we put him in the gas chamber and, and kill him? The, the Bible does say, talk about capital punishment in, right. in, in a just sense. So, pa- Paul said in... So uh, the ending of a life isn't necessarily murder. Correct. Okay, so how, how would both sides of you, I'd like to hear your answer, and I'll take this off the phone so I can listen, but how would you compare and contrast abortion with capital punishment? What... What laws, what, what lines have to be drawn to, to determine a difference between one is socially sanctified murder and that's okay, and, and yet you say abortion is, is not okay. socially, should not socially be sanctified okay. and, and considered murder? May I go first? Right. Sure. Okay, first of all, as I've tried to explain, I don't think a fetus, oh no, I don't think a fetus can suffer, so I don't consider that murder. I think what's wrong with capital punishment primarily is we sometimes kill the wrong person. We've killed 22 people between 1900 and 1950 in the electric chair that are later later proven to be innocent. Now, that may not seem too bad until it's your daughter or your mother that's, you know, falsely accused and circumstantial evidence goes against her. And maybe she's down in some state like George Bush's Texas where that sadistic monster didn't care too much about whether somebody was 
innocent or not. George Bush's mother, Barbara, told Diane Sawyer that when George was a little boy, he loved to stick firecrackers down frogs and toads' mouths and blow them up, and he would just laugh. That man is a sadist. Maybe that's why he set a record for 170-some executions in Texas. He probably got off on it. Perverted <clears throat> monster. Okay. Well, I would say this. I would say this. The difference is it gets back to what I've been trying to set forth all night is justice or a sense, a an objective standard of right and wrong. Is it justice to kill an innocent a, person? I, I'm saying no, but I'm saying it is just to set forth a way to try to determine that. Now, I'm not saying everybody After does that. you've I'm killed an innocent it's not, man, it's not, not justice. Okay. Uh, everybody everybody that, that is sentenced to death, capital punishment, surely they're, they're not all guilty. Certainly there have been some innocent individuals put to death. But that doesn't negate the fact that a just system can put to death an offender. Paul said in Acts 25, 11, he says, If I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they may accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal to Caesar. So he said, look, if I have committed a capital uh, uh, an offense, I don't, I don't have a problem with dying. You know, there is a sentence that's worthy of death. But in the case of a uh, an unborn child, I don't care how, how fetus, whatever you want to term you want to use, a, an innocent child, even if they if they've been born, uh, you know, Barack Obama, you know, wouldn't pass a law that would actually give uh, medical attention to a child that was aborted but yet survived. And I'm saying here here we have the idea of uh, an innocent child uh, being put to death, and so it gets down to innocence or guilt. And you know, I've talked to people who've been in prison. They said, you know what, I was, I was in jail. For, for wrongdoing. It wasn't for something I did wrong, but I deserve to be in there for something else. And so I'm saying there is a system, there is a system as a place. No, it's not perfect because it has uh, in individuals, humans involved in it. But yes, there is a great, a great difference between capital punishment for an offender and evildoer society and killing an innocent uh, being, whether it be born or not born. Now, I mean, if you can't see the difference between innocence and guilt, then, you know, we are in a sad shape. But, but I just said that sometimes we kill the innocent. Let me tell you what Leo Tolstoy said. But about. I don't know why you would complain about capital punishment killing somebody innocent that, that's, that's had their chance to live, but yet you don't have a problem with, with killing uh, an innocent Because I don't thing think, they, I keep telling you, I don't think fetuses can, no, can you, suffer. No, don't harm any living thing is wholesome. It's what you wrote. And yet, well, you, you've admitted that a fetus is living. It's much worse to harm somebody that can suffer and go into pain. Let me tell you what Leo Tolstoy said about All right, we're going to run out of time. Okay, let me call. just quickly say this. Tolstoy said the worst thing about capital punishment, no matter how heinous the, the murderer or the whatever, no matter how terrible his crime, no matter how unremorseful he is, is that we teach children to look up to our best people, the men in suits and ties that we're supposed to re respect, that those men sometimes will take a helpless, caged person and kill him. And he just felt like that was a terrible example to children. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to say that, you know, it, it gets back to this. Just because individuals don't adhere to a righteous law does not make the law unrighteous. It's just like I said about the speed limit. Just because I'm going 70 miles an hour in a 55 doesn't mean that the 55 mile an hour speed limit is wrong. I agree with you. So, uh, Larry, listen, we're, we're actually to the point of our last speeches. Do you want to take some more phone calls and, or you want... You want the seven minutes? Well, we can take some I'm, more I'm phone calls. We, I've we, got we, some we, closing we, remarks here that well, I, I'm going to well, read them, and they won't take uh, very long. So well, go and take what, some more let's, calls. Let's, take, let's uh, we'll, we'll cut our last minutes down to five minutes. Okay. How about, how about sure. That? All right. We'll take we'll take maybe a, one or two more calls. You on the word of the Lord? Hey, how y'all doing? Fine. All right. In God's word, uh, the Bible says uh, to him that said there is not a God, he is a fool. Does not the Bible say that? Yes, a man. A man who in his heart says there is no God is a fool. Yeah, that's in the Bible. That's certainly in the Bible. And, and you can call me a fool, but I, just because it's in the Bible, what if it was in Pinocchio and it said Geppetto made a puppet out of wood and later on after a lot of troubles and being a real disobedient puppet, he, the head fairy with the blue hair turned him into a... Because Pinocchio doesn't, doesn't have inspired proof to it. And if we want to get into it, the Bible inspired... I have haven't that. seen that, any well, inspired that's, proof. Well, that's another... That's another yeah, I know, uh, listen, listen. I know it says God, that the Bible says a man who says in his heart there's no God is a fool. I'm very aware of that. I've been aware of that since I was still believed in God and went to the Methodist church, but it doesn't impress me. It means nothing to me. 
Okay. Okay. Let, can I say one more thing real quick? If you're quick. I'm, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that y'all brought out this point on uh, abortion uh, because right now that um, you're going to see that this coming week brought up in the Republican platform okay. because the Republicans are pro-life. A child is a life. A child is not a choice. All right. And for all, all those right. people, Th- listen. That no, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, listen. We won't ask questions. You know, if we wanted political statements and comments, whatever, we'll give them if we want to. But but uh, we reserve that right. But we're trying to get some calls in here. All right, you're on word from the Lord. Last call. Okay, um, I'm just calling in. I'd like to say uh, to the gentleman on the left, I'm actually looking Question. at the vision. Oh, with all due respect, mm-hmm. you, you've got the right not to believe in God. Um, I'm going to go with James. I do believe in God. And I'll just say this. I would rather believe in him and die and find out that it wasn't one then not believe in him and die and find out that it was. That's called Pascal's wager. A Frenchman, Blaise Pascal, <clears throat> used that argument years ago. He says, I'm hedging my bets. I'm going to try to believe in it, so if I die, then I'll go to heaven. And if it turns out there is no God and I didn't lose anything, I think you did lose a whole life of free I've, and quiet. I've, I've, I've met a lot of so-called atheists, but I've only met one, and she was raised in Russia. And she came to the United States, and she was raised atheist. Now, personally, I've got the right to think that you are not a true atheist. I just think you're on there for attention. No, I'm not trying to get attention. James is an atheist, too, when it comes to Zeus. No. No, theism says you believe in a god. Atheism means you don't. You're one of the ones that just want attention. Well, you can think that, but it's not true. All right. All right. Larry, you got five. We're going to – Larry's going to have five more minutes to uh, give his last – Discussion. So, Matt, if you could put a, another backdrop up, please. Give me my microscope back. I think that's so appropriate. <clears throat> okay, I'm not going to need five minutes, James. I'm just going to read my closing remarks. I'm very sorry that the gentleman that just called in felt like I was Sheik Nora Dean, that I was just seeking attention. I'm not. I am desperately trying to get out some ideas that you don't hear about Rockingham County, around Rockingham County. I believe these things. And I've read an enormous amount, and maybe I'll be convinced another way someday, but when the gentleman called in and said, I'm just up here trying to get attention, he's wrong. He's dead wrong. Okay, this is what I'd like to say in closing. Once again, I want to thank James Oldfield for allowing somebody like me to be on his show because we couldn't disagree more. But I think he's a fine man on a lot of levels because he did allow somebody this drastically different from his beliefs to be on this show, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart, James, or from the bottom of my brain. I try not to think with my heart, son. But anyway, this is my closing remarks. If a divine creator fashioned all that there is, then he must have made breast cancer, childhood leukemia, Alzheimer's disease, and malaria. Think about it. If he made all there is, then he must have made breast cancer, childhood leukemia, Alzheimer's disease, and malaria. When you get down to it, the only evidence of God's existence is that holy men, past and present, say he exists. And think how many falsehoods have been sworn by men to be true. Only those proved true after unlimited research deserve to be believed. James couldn't get his God to help him read this thing I had in the newspaper a while ago, and that would have been great if he could have because that would have really won a lot of souls for for Jesus, but he didn't. Preachers from Leroy Jenkins, who sends out bottles of miracle water, to Jim Baker have built a trillion dollar empire based on the claim that unseen deities wait to reward or punish. They're either going to send you to hell or they're going to send you to heaven, and there's been a lot of gods and a lot of devils. But such preachers once said witches were real. A true moral philosophy would have no need to invent acts of God Baptism, whether immersion or sprinkling, hell, prayer wheels, rosary beads, transubstantiation. That's where the Catholics say that when you drink the wine at communion, it actually turns to real blood, although scientific tests show that it still has all the chemical and physical properties of, of wine. We wouldn't need a pope. We wouldn't need virgin birth. By the way, I don't believe Jesus ever claimed in the Gospels that he was born of a virgin. Uh, We wouldn't need angels. We certainly wouldn't need animal and human sacrifice. It gives me a wonderful, clean feeling like a hot, soapy shower to have shed the religion of my mother that I was brought up with. And I loved my mother. My mother died two years ago, and I was 
my mother, I was an only child. My mother was dear. But my mother, I think, was wrong and had been brainwashed all her life and hadn't been very critical of religion. It gives me a wonderful, clean feeling to have gotten away from that religion. I think all religion's crazy. All of it. Everyone that's ever existed. I think it was a handicapping condition for me. But I do not reject everything in the Bible. I like the Sermon on the Mount, as I said earlier. They want the Ten Commandments on the walls, but they don't put the Sermon on the Mount up on the Pentagon saying, blessed are the peacemakers. That wouldn't do. And they don't put the Sermon on the Mount up on the wall of the New York Stock Exchange saying, blessed are the poor. That wouldn't do either. In a sermon, Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verse 44, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, write this down, folks, to love our enemies, not bomb them. And you're going to tell me America's a Christian nation as we take over the world and have 900 military bases everywhere. We've killed 600,000 innocent people in Iraq for wealth, for power. Jesus says, love our enemies. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, this has been ignored by almost every Christian preacher that has ever lived. Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus says, Do not judge lest that you be ju unless you be judged. I'm sorry, I can't get that right. Judge not lest ye be judged. Christians are notorious for judging. And they judge all other religions and denominations but their own. I thank you very much for listening to this. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Well, I say you're welcome, Larry, and I'm going to agree to a certain point with what Larry said about uh, religions, uh, Leroy Jenkins and all those individuals who make merchandise in the name of Christ. To me, they have more in common with Larry than they do with the, the God of the Bible because they don't really believe in God or they would follow what he says. That's what I'm saying about that. Because if it, when it gets right down to it, if they really were convinced that the God of the Bible is who they should be serving, and they are really convinced that the, that the Bible is his word, they wouldn't be abusing individuals. They wouldn't be misusing individuals. They actually have more in common with the humanistic idea of ethics being uh, whatever one determines from their own interests or their own needs. And so that's why we're trying to get, get individuals to realize this. If you just want to go through life and say, well, I'm a Christian, and not really adhere to the Bible, then you're never going to change society like the Bible says you should. Jesus said you ought to be salt of the earth and lie of the world. Now, <clears throat> when I talked to Larry the other day, and he was talking about how uh, moral he was, then I asked him about the... Uh, I asked him about his background, his, 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 his rear, uh, upper, upbringing. His, his raising, I was always told you weren't, you weren't raised, you were reared, but uh, <clears throat> the, the fact of the matter is he's telling us, friends, he's telling us. His mother was a Methodist. His father was a Presbyterian. I believe I have that right. No, 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 both Methodists. Both Methodists, okay. So, but, but here's my point. He was exposed to the truth of God's word from a child. And so to say that he shed religion is really, is really a, a falsehood. It's a misnomer. It's a misleader because... In reality, that is what fomented what he now realizes is a good and wholesome life. You see, the, the, the things that he says are morals, he didn't get that from the Humanist Manifesto. He didn't get that from evolution. He got that from God's Word. And it just goes to show that a little bit of God's truth actually has a profound effect even when it is uh, applied incorrectly. The idea that he's holding to the, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, that just shows, friends, that what God said a long time before Larry Serber came along, a long time before the Humanist Manifesto, a long time before Charles Darwin, that was there, and it was the ground, it was the foundation of, 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 of true love for humanity, but it came from the mind of God. And when Larry's asking me to, to prove something, to get him to believe, you know what God said in Isaiah 55, in verse uh, 8, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God does not expect individuals to test or prove him uh, if they, and, uh, to the point of excluding what he said. 
If you're going to believe God, you're going to use what he has revealed to you in order to find him. Paul said that God's not very far from us, Acts 17, if we just look for him. But if someone wants to look for God in a way other than what God's revealed, you'll never find him. And so I, I don't know. I hope Larry is, is sincere in, in looking, you know, trying to find truth and examine things. I think we might make some headway with him, but I don't know. But my point is the only way you're going to find God is through the means that he said. So don't be expecting God. Uh, and about judging, you know, to criticize Christianity for, for judging is really, is, is really a, uh, again, a misunderstanding about what God wants. God says judging is right if it is righteous. But you will never have righteous judgment. You will never be able to say this is good, righteous, or this is bad, evil, unrighteous, unless you have a standard uh, for authority. I want to put this one question up for you to think about, uh, for, for, especially for Larry to think about, just to show the, the, uh, uh, the undisputable proof, I believe, fact that there is a higher moral law that is over everybody in every country. In torturing and murdering six million Jews, the Nazis were guilty of violating which law? Choose any that apply. If they all apply, check them all. If they don't even apply, don't check them all. But which law did they violate? Was it the law of Germany? No, that law said they should kill them. Which law was it? The law of England? No. The law of England doesn't have any uh, sway, any authority over the laws of Germany. It wasn't the law of the United States. There's no sway over, uh, no authority over the, the people of German, Germany. Was it some other law? Which law was it? The law of the humanist, you see? Which law says that it was wrong? No, it can't be the humanist law because the humanist law says ethics are defined by your needs or your interests. So which law was it? It couldn't be no law at all or you wouldn't say it's wrong. See, if it's, if it's, if it's wrong, there has to be a law to say it's wrong, to tell you what is right and wrong. Paul said where there is no law, there is no sin. So it has to be the law of God. There has to be a higher law. And that's the argument that was made at the Nuremberg trials when they condemned the Nazis of, of the atrocities they committed against the Jewish people. It was because there was a higher law that superseded all the transient, that is the, the passing, and the, uh, and the provisional. It doesn't matter if it's Germany, England, USA, Japan, Russia, whatever. There is a law that governs them all. That's why Daniel said in Daniel 4.25, he said that God is ruling in the kingdoms of men and giveth them to whomsoever he will. When, when, a, when a nation is righteous, they will prosper because of the righteous laws they are, are following. And when they're wicked, they will always falter and fall and crumble. And another nation will come in and take over. So, uh, friends, I hope you'll think about that. We're, I, I don't know exactly what time we are, but I'm sure we're running close on time. So, we have, we have just two minutes. That's enough for, for us to run our, our closing. So, Larry, I want, to, I want to say thank you for, for being here, and I hope maybe we can uh, get together some other time. I uh, would love it. I, can't, I went to Larry's house. I'll say that he was, uh, uh, I found him to be hospitable. Mark and I was at his house, and, and uh, very, uh, very courteous. He and his wife, very hospitable to us. But uh, uh, fundamentally, we definitely do disagree. Uh, I, uh, I hope that nothing happens to him on the way home, because I sure would hate for him to... <laughs> Uh, I'd hate for him to be a believer. Five, I've had, I've had, five, five I've seconds had after he life. dies, he's going to be a believer. I've had I know a great that, life. So, uh, if I die and cease to exist, that's okay. Well, I don't. I, I think if, I, if you die, then you you won't be an atheist anymore. So, friends, until until next time, we thank you for watching, and we hope that you have gained something from this. As again, if you'd like a copy of this program, just write me, email me at wordofthelord@gmail.com, or you can call me at two seven six three four zero two six five three. Until next time. I always insist on getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Have you ever wondered why so many people who claim to follow this book teach so many different doctrines? It doesn't make sense. Hi, I'm James Oldfield, a local evangelist for the Church of Christ. And if you believe that getting back to the book is the solution for unity, then come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting at the Holiday Inn Express Conference Room, 10 a.m. every Sunday. And I'm also hosting a word from the Lord, which airs every Thursday night at 9 p.m. right here on Star 39.